last class and maybe get into the next one. <clears throat> um, we were talking about the Garden of Eden representing the original creation of God in the sense of <clears throat> all was new, all was awe-inspiring, all was um, <clears throat> ordered. Everything was ordered by God. Everything was set in motion by God. Now we create our own world, we create our own you know, lives, our own homes, our own jobs, our own friends, our own recreation, our own, we choose all the things we want and buy what we want. And, and it sounds great. I mean, um, I, I, I know parents who have had kids and when their kids are little, they go, you know, we want our kids to have, um, uh, well, I can use us as an example. We want our kids to, to um, learn things and have fun and do things. And so um, <clears throat> what we did was we, of course, I've got three girls, so we enroll them in learning piano, and they all took piano. Well, of course, they all took ballet, and of course, they all took gymnastics. And, you know, you start that way, and as you're going, pretty soon there's three of them, and there, one's got to be here at this time, and then this one over here at this time, and then this and that, and then all of a sudden, and pretty soon, what was meant to be just a fun release for your kids ends up controlling your life. And I mean it does. It, it dictates when you can go, what you can be involved with. Well, I can't because that's going to overlap on when I have to pick them up and da-da-da-da and all this and on and on and on. And this is just a small little example. Um, the world of our creation and how it ends up controlling us. Whereas um, in using the, using the Garden of Eden as an example, God was in control. God set things in order, and we flowed with God. Once man fell, he's outside of that realm. He's outside of that garden. Now he is digging in the dirt, eking out his own life. So one of the last statements I, I read was uh, in the last class, there was all in the Garden of Eden. All was new, alive, ready to be discovered. And, and in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation at the end, it says, Jesus says this of himself, behold, I make all things new. Now, what most Christians get out of that is he makes a whole new creation of like a you know, it's this new realm of same, same stuff, only better. But he said, I make them new, not I'm creating them new. I'm making all things new <clears throat> so that righteousness, when you discover Christ, becomes new and all comes into it. Um, uh, uh, peace, um, all of the, the subjects, all of the doctrinal, doctrinal, you know, the things that are just doctrinal, Folks, this was never meant to be a doctrinal universe. Doctrinal is, uh, well, I, I say something down here along that line. <clears throat> um, all was new, alive, and then this thought, ready to be discovered. But what was in Adam and Eve was, we're new to this. Everything's new. I mean, you know, does anybody remember when you were a kid and, and um, <clears throat> uh, you would, like, look at a flower or something and, uh, I, I remember we were studying birds at school, and I found this dead bird, uh, and I put it in a box, and the next day I brought it to school and asked the teacher about it. We were studying birds, and she said, I've never seen this bird before. Let's look it up. And we personally got in the book together and looked it up, and there was a cedar waxwing, and it was all excited. And I went, a cedar waxwing? Never even heard of it. I don't know anybody's even even seen them. Or, they're beautiful. They are beautiful birds. 
last week in our backyard, there were 10 of them in our tree. And I mean, they're, it's there. <clears throat> anyway, I remember as a little boy, I remember seeing a bumblebee. I mean, the full big bumblebee, you know, the one that shouldn't be able to fly. They're not aerodynamic and they weigh more than they should be able to, to lift. And therefore, they sort of you know, go like this and everything. And I didn't know what it was. All I saw was that the tail, the back of it, looked fluffy and fuzzy and with yellow lines and black lines. And I remember going, oh, my God, what is it? And I caught it, and it stung the fool out of me. And I went, you don't catch those things, OK? <clears throat> but I remember, I remember, I literally remember in my mind thinking, my God, what is that? Look how cool that thing looks and everything. And just, just being into, well, you know, you know, except we become as little children, you know, you won't really comprehend these things. There has to be a desire to discover instead of an, uh, what did I say? Um, soon the all began to fade. Life became flat, sterile, controllable, understood. Those last two are really important. Once we start controlling everything, then we, it's, out of, it's really, we've lost any thought of going beyond what we already control. Once we think we've understood something, we're not open anymore. Scott? Yeah, I was just thinking about how, you know, we can approach the scriptures. We're talking about losing your arm the scriptures. We can approach the scriptures and, and uh, look at something a little higher. something wrong if we look at any, any part of the Bible and, we, and, and that's our mentality because it's like you know, the whole idea of, of all things new. You know, I mean everything every time we go into the, into the Word we should we should go into the expectation that the Lord is going to reveal himself in some new way that we've never seen him before. Amen. Amen. We, if you didn't, are, are you recording that somewhere? Yeah, okay, good for you. <clears throat> um, you know, just along the lines of what Scott's saying, <clears throat> there is this reality that when, you know, if you, if you, let's say that you're out exploring or you go to, uh, I remember when I went to Stone Mountain in Georgia, um, and you go up on the mountain, and you're overlooking, I think, three different states. And it really is cool. I mean, you can really see, you see the different states. You see this big thing. <clears throat> and there's, there's an automatic thing that kicks in to every human when they get to a height where they can begin to overlook things. The person automatically wants to get into to a restful place, sit down or go, or, or, you know, and just take it in and just rest and just meditate and just, <clears throat> and they, they begin to, whether, you know, whether it's a river down there, they're just, you know, they just want to take it in. You know, you don't just go, oh, that's cool and go, you know what I mean? Something in you wants to actually take in the vista in a restful manner without all of the feverish you know, sort of, you know, well, I got to know this for school, or I've got to, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and, um, um, you know, it causes reflection. What does? Being up above things and viewing them from higher than our life in a normal way. It just starts bringing out reflection in us, and and it and it invites you to sit down and rest and and to just enjoy, enjoy. That's actually a part of it. Well, that's a part of the awe. Is the enjoying? Yes. Does the <clears throat> I said, read to me about the garden. And he started reading about Adam and Eve and how uh, Eve was there. And the story is that she told Adam, they were standing there, and I got a picture of her, beautiful, and Adam was good looking. 
And she took and she ate that apple. And then she looked at Adam and she said, Adam, I don't feel the same. I feel cold. Like, I'm, I'm not wearing any clothes. I'm naked. Mm -hmm. And he, like, I was looking at this picture when he was reading to me that Adam wasn't as good looking anymore. He started getting, like, creepy. Mm -hmm. And then to her. Mm -hmm. And then, so when he became this and her, then he took the bite. He said, after she told, after she was aware of the way she felt, then he took the bite. Mm -hmm. And she consciously said that out loud. So she took a bite, and then she said, I don't feel good, Adam. I, I feel cold. Mm -hmm. And she was aware of her, right. of herself. Of the change. And then all of a sudden, he changed in her. Right. He changed. He never really changed, but he changed in her mind, her view. Right. Because of what was going on with her. Amen. <clears throat> It's an amazing, I mean, and we, we also lose, we lose that sense of awe. We lose that, <clears throat> that desire for discovery. I see this in married couples all the time. And, and, you know, I still do counseling with couples and I hear a real common thing and that is, <clears throat> you know, uh, whether they put it in this words or not, they have lost uh, the sense of trying to discover something new because they think they know everything because they've been married for x amount of of years or whatever and so and um my opinion here you know that woman is like a universe that always has something new to be discovered i mean really honestly that they're that I, I believe that. Now, that just because I believe it doesn't make it true. But I believe that there's always something more, always something new, always something fresh. <clears throat> but we settle into these five things. And the bad thing is, see, nobody, whether husband or wife, nobody is allowed to grow out of that. Even if they do grow out of it, we still hold them into the place of those things. This is you. Now, there's not a person alive that that hadn't happened to, and they, they don't hate it, that, that, that many people still look at them the way they used to be when they're not that way anymore. And they're, they're accused, can I use that word, accused of being that, that way, and they're not. And so, so even if they don't have all of those things at that moment, and I believe they do, life will bring new discoveries about. And so... I'm just trying to say this pattern that's true here is here and here. It's in sociology. It's in quantum physics. It's in the things of God because that's the original source. It's in the universe so that there's always something new to discover. Always something new to discover. <clears throat> God made it that way. It's endless. But it's not just that there's nothing new in them. It's that we have lost our seeking to discover something new, expectation to discover something new, and to, you know, it's like dating. Oh, wow, red is your favorite color? You know, you know well, there, there's all in that, but it sure don't last long, you know? And then, then you say, now, what's your favorite color? You know, we've been married 10 years. What's your favorite color? Well, it used to be red, but now it's yellow. Really? How long ago? When did you make that change? About five years ago. Really? <laughs> I, know what I, I know what I'm talking about. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. And you go, five years ago, huh? <laughs> Bang me. <laughs> you know? Because... Apparently, we're not, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about me, too. I mean, apparently, we're not seeking to discover. All is controlled. And let me tell you, when it gets controlled, it gets boring. When it gets boring, it gets stagnant. When it gets stagnant, it goes south on you. You know. <clears throat> anyway. Yes. Yes. Well, 
Well, I guess. I think every Christian thinks they fellowship with God. But, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, okay, anybody ever seen the Sistine Chapel? We, we have. <clears throat> and we, they had, we, we walk, you know, you're, you're going through St. Peter's Basilica, and you go through, and you come into the Sistine Chapel. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, it really is awesome. It's just awesome. It's just an incredible, incredible thing. Um, and so you say, now, you know, I can see me looking up and going, now why does this look the way that it does? Because the church paid him. But is that really the reason? Is that really the, all that's put into that? Is the real reason that he was paid and he did his job? You answer me. No. No. There's more than just doing the job in that. And that goes contrary to the American way. It didn't used to. They used to be different. But the American way now is just do the job at, with whatever cheap materials you can do to get it done, and bam, there it is. Be happy with it. You worked in construction, isn't that true? Many cases, and you, you you go the cheapest way, you find the cheapest thing, and even if it's a shoddy job, you know, tough luck, you know, uh, that's just the way it, it works. <clears throat> there you go, duct tape and and, and bailing wire. <clears throat> Sorry, my old. <clears throat> uh, but, but, okay, a soldier, a soldier that dies, a soldier that goes into battle and he gives his life. Why does he do that? Well, he does, he does that because he signed a two-year contract to be in the military. No. Now, some, maybe some of them, but there are some soldiers that believe in what they're doing and the awe of the thing, and I know them. I was in the Army one of the only people in this church that was in the military. And I know, I know, I was a sergeant in the army. I was in the army during the Vietnam War. I know. And there are, there, these, these people, we call them lifers. I mean, this is it. This is, they have found their home. This is it. And they are gung-ho and that, that, this is what, and it has nothing to do with how many years they signed a contract for or anything else. They are all in. So I'm just, I'm trying to give you some different examples where awe has, even though that's just a physical example, it's not the real. But we talk about spiritual things and we all say, well, I know what you're talking about. So I'm using some examples that I'm trying to shake and rattle the box that our little brains are in to realize that there are, you know, that, that Michelangelo worked hard and he laid on his back and he did this and he breathed something into that. You know, you know God made man and he created him in his own image and he, and he makes him and he, he, he finishes this work and, you know, and he goes, well, get up. No. He breathes into him the breath of life. And something comes alive in him. I think the breath of life is missing in many people, honestly. And how do you put that? I can't put that in somebody. The, my sharing can't do that. My sharing, my sharing can really touch somebody on a real deep, deep level. It can. It can touch someone on a core level if they already have that questioning or that hungering or that or that sense of you know I am sick of the way things are going my life sucks or whatever you know what I mean I am sick of this then something rings in your being it reverberates in your being and I, I haven't said that but I mean the the basic smallest element that physicists believe that all things, the smallest particle you could break things down to, they believe is a string. They believe in what's called string theory. And they believe, you know, I mean, at, we used to think atoms were so small. They're nothing. I mean, there are, there are subatomic particles that atoms are made of, electrons and neutrons, you know what I mean? So those are subatomic. 
And then, then you go beyond that. So much so, so much so, because see, okay, if everything's made of atoms or subatomic particles that make up atoms or even beyond that, if everything, everything, if water is made of atoms, if fire is made of atoms, if, if, if uh, this metal and me is made of atoms, if you know, a building is, if they're all made of atoms, we go, well, how can that be? The building doesn't live, but we do. Man cannot live by bread alone. There must be something more. There has to be something beyond just the physics of atoms or string, string theory. But string theory has, has some very promising realities working with it that may prove out that it is the prime thing. And just the thought of string theory speaks, and it's not just a string, it's a reverberating string. We'll get into all that. This, we're jumping the gun here. But I, but I was saying, you know, here, all of this stuff, all of this is made of atoms, and yet there are subatomic particles that are way smaller than electrons and all this other stuff. For, for example, <coughs> neutrinos are going right out. You know, they're coming up out of the earth. They're shooting right through us, literally shooting right through us right now. Particles. Particle, literal particles shooting through your body. Okay. <clears throat> we say, we say, well, this, all these things here, this is matter. Air, this is, this is not matter. This is space. And, and water, that's, that's matter, but, you know, but you can't shove your hand through you but you can through water. But no, it's all atoms and smaller, but it's all particles, every bit of it, except some things are denser than others. Okay? Meaning more compacted than others. More solid in the very real realm. What, what, what would be the most solid thing that you could think of? The most solid thing. What would it be? More solid than that. Pardon? More solid, way more solid than those. How about, uh, how about a uh, black hole? A neutron star that, that went supernova? The core? The core of a supernova? Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Absolutely. And what is a black hole? What is a neutron star? It's nothing more than the death of the sun. S-U-N, but S-O-N. It's nothing more. It is the most solid thing that there is. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just... I'm getting off a little bit, but I want to just paint this picture to you. We, we say, we say this is all matter. This is matter. Well, that's totally based on where we're at in the whole thing. If you are a neutrino that can shoot in between our atoms because it's smaller than us, we're not matter at all. We don't matter at all. I mean, we're not matter at all. And what if, and I'm not saying that there is, but I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, what if, okay, let's just say that there was a world of neutrons and, other, and, and, and neutrinos, no, I'm sorry, I meant neutrinos. There's a world of neutrinos and with it, particles we don't even know, strings, uh, uh, gravity loops, all sorts of stuff like that. And it's an actual, like, world it's just on such a subatomic level we can't even comprehend it so that in that world this isn't matter it floats in between our atoms and it just doesn't seem like anything okay now just make believe what if there was a bigger world and we were the subatomic particle types 
to that. And we're walking through beings that are so big we don't even know they're there. And I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make you think because if it's true on that level, it could be true on this level. But our world to us is everything because we're everything. See? And we're what matters. And therefore, this is matter when I'm telling you it's all made up of atoms and, and air and water and all of this. It just depends on how solid the core is. And with a black hole, not even light escapes it. Sucks it right in. And it sucks it into the core and keeps compacting it and compacting it. It's incredible. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like where they map the complexity and density of the parts of the universe and all of it. If you put it right next to, it looks shockingly similar to a brain cell. To a brain cell. Well, there you have it. <clears throat> um, but, of course it would. But why? Why? Oh, because there are space realities beyond what we know? No, no, one reason, one reason alone. All of it declares the truth of God in his reality, not that the aliens exist or that there are tiny spaceships flying through your body right now. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's important to understand that all of this, if the Bible's true and if Jesus is true, all of that exists simply to declare the glory of God. And if, if it does, then the pattern is going to be seen over and over and over again, just like what he described, or the pattern will be seen in sociology as well as quantum mechanics, as well as uh, uh, mechanical engineering, as well as chemistry, which all of these things do, I'm telling you. There are certain realities that that whole truth. <clears throat> All right, I need to try to finish this because I am not going to even finish this if I'm not careful. Um, <clears throat> we are so busy with making sure that the wood from violins is the best and that strings are set in perfect tune with an artificial tuner so that it'll ring at A440, isn't that it? And so, and, and so I'm, basically I'm going to try to describe something to you that I saw here. I saw a universe where the craftsman had taken over. And the violin was the object upon which they worked. And they were master craftsmen. And there was one after another after another. And their goal was to get just the right kind of wood. And their goal was just to, to, to shape it just perfectly. And their goal was to polish it just perfectly. Their goal was to find the right strings that would make it just, you know, the, be beautiful. And their goal was to make sure that this thing, this thing that they were all concentrating on was in tune. And that everybody be in tune with everybody else. Anybody sort of following me? So imagine such a world. Imagine such a world where that's the case, but there is no musicians. So in this world, they're all working hard and they're all producing these incredible violins and they're all, they have shows and they all, you know, have booths and they're showing off their violin and everything. And all of a sudden, one day, something insane walks in. A musician picks one up and he's an incredible musician and he just starts playing. And they're all going, what is that? What? Did you see the all reaction. <laughs> the all reaction. What is it? And he's and they're going, what's he, what's he doing to that? You know? That's a whole nother angle of this thing we never thought of. 
and they're just blown away by, by this one who took it and did something with it that wasn't actually practical in the, in the realm of what they call practical. It wasn't pragmatic. And they just, you know, they didn't know what to do. Let's, let's see what I wrote here. Uh, but, but when someone who has ability to play picks it up and plays, we see that there is another touch, that's in parentheses, another touch beyond what we perceived. And I don't know if you've ever heard somebody play the violin where it literally plays the heartstrings of your own heart, but I have. And I'm telling you, you just go, oh my God. I mean, it just rings in your, it's like string theory. It just rings, it reverberates in your being. I mean, you just want to cry or laugh or, or something. It just deeply, deeply affects you. And, and the person is just, there is more than playing going on. They are putting their heart and soul, their being into it, and you feel it, and it's, it's just enveloping you. And <clears throat> so, uh, th I'll read that again. But when someone who has the ability to play picks it up and plays, we see that there is another touch beyond what we perceived. The craftsmen who cannot play are increased while the ma maestros die out. And my God, that is what's happening in the church. The craftsmen who keep everything in tune and polished are in control. And the maestros are dying out and the, the ring, the awe is disappearing. There was a time when the maestros were in charge. There was a time. Soon all that is left is those who glory in the object and in their own workmanship. Are you getting that? Their only glory in all the, and how good they make their particular violin look. The music is lost. The sound is not heard. The spiritual realities of which these exist cannot be measured or computed. You can see the difference between a maestro and a craftsman, but you cannot compute those differences. You cannot compute the difference of all. You cannot calculate it. You cannot quantify it. You cannot control it. You cannot, you, you, you know what? You can't even possess it unless certain things happen to you. I remember this story, and you know, I probably told it before, but I, way, way back when, when, you know, I think it was in the law west of the Pecos. I think that's where it took place, which was uh, El Paso. And, and there was a man who owned uh, a saloon. This was back in the cowboy days, and it was the Jersey Lily. Anybody remember that story? And the Jersey Lily was the name of this saloon, and he had this uh, uh, girl that sang there, and she had a great voice and everything, and she, she could sing, but it really, you know, it just wasn't drawing people in. It just wasn't doing the trick. <clears throat> and so the owner went and found this really good-looking guy and this guy that was real suave and, you know, suave, rico, and, and paid him to go woo this girl and to fall, have, get her to fall in love with him. And then, then he broke up with her, left her, and broke her heart. And, and this is supposedly a true story. And after that, when she sang, they said, was just from a depth that they could not explain and, and it filled up the Jersey Lily and people came from afar to hear this woman sing. <clears throat> well, I know a little bit about that. It's called the blues. And, you know, I mean, 
I like that kind of music, but I know where it comes from. And, and they say white men can't sing the blues. I'm sorry, I can sing the blues, and I can sing it like the best of them because I know what pain is, and I know what hurt is, and I know these kind of things. But, I, you know, I mean, there's people way greater than me, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of the good blues singers that were white came out of Oak Cliff. <laughs> Stevie Ray Vaughan and whatever, because it's tough. <clears throat> but but the, the point I'm trying to make is not me or blues or this or that. The point I'm trying to make is a person can have their own talents. They can have their own abilities. They can have their own want to. But only until certain things take place does it release something that is beyond what could be perceived. It is deep. It is on a quantum level. But it has effects on an astrophysics level. We'll explain all that when we finally get to quantum physics because we're, we're still, I mean, this is all the introduction. You know that, don't you? <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let me see if I can finish this up here. We're getting real close. We, speaking of the craftsmen who build the violins, we take great pride of achievement of measuring and computing the shadow, speaking of quantum physics or any kind of physics. We are, those are only a shadow of the true, we don't, learn the truth from these things, we're too busy studying the shadow. We don't get Jesus out of it. We don't get the heart of the truth. We don't get the core. We don't get the essence. We don't get the all. We get the calculations. We get the doctrines. We get the measurements. We get the computer to spit out something that makes sense so that we feel comfortable and controlled, <laughs> sterile, flat, and understood. <clears throat> the only sound we draw from them is to make sure all is in tune craftsman. The only sound is to make sure you pluck those strings. You're not in tune. I'm in tune. You're not in tune. You know, I have, I have gotten here late, picked up a guitar to have to play lead, and the guitar was out of tune and couldn't stop to do that. And the good news about the kind of player I am is you and not all guitar players learn this, but particularly in blues you do, you bend strings. And so I could play in tune by taking what was out of tune and bending it to the right note. You know? And I've done it more times than I'd like to admit. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not necessarily a compliment, but it's, it, it helps us to see a principle, and that is just being in tune is not enough. What if it wasn't in tune, but it was bent to tune, and there was a great release of the Lord even in that worship service because of something higher than being in tune? You're, are you following me? There, there are much more important things, and we want to get to the core of these things. I, our, we're, we're not here just to study. We're not here just to, just to you know, casually carry on we want the Lord and we want him in a real way on a level that will change us from within and if we're not being changed we're not satisfied the problem is many after a period of time when they've tried to change and don't change get satisfied get complacent and sit back and they lose the hunger they lose the all they lose the desire for discovery
So the only sound we draw from these objects is to make sure all is in tune. There's no melody. There's no harmony, just law. Just make sure everything's right. Sound that does not war work toward keeping everything in tune is seen as being not practical. The purpose of sound is to make sure we're all in tune. Why, if, we do, if, if it wasn't for sound, we wouldn't know where we stand in relation to one another. But thank God for sound. Where's harmony in that? No, we don't need harmony for tuning. <laughs> Some of you who are musicians really know what I'm talking about. But I mean, you know, well, where's melody? You know, you know, the melody is this. Ding, 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 ding. You know, that's, that's our melody. That's lovely to the sound of us, the ears of us craftsmen. The, the maestro says, those are tuning notes. There is nothing of life being drawn out of that instrument. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're wrong, dude. This is all very practical. You're just talking about and trying to touch our heartstrings. We're keeping everything ordered. The, the wonderful thing about physics, there's this, there's this two sides, this relativity and this quantum side. And relativity is a study of physics from a certain angle, and it is proven true, but it has certain limitations. And quantum theory also has proven to be true, but it has certain limitations. And, what, and I'll get into this next class, but, but what's being sought is a unifying theory that brings it all together. But the quantum realm freaks out the relativity realm because in the relativity realm, determinism or you can, you know, everything's working toward an end is clear, whereas the quantum realm, you get down deep enough into the string area and it looks like chaos. Now it's not, it looks like chaos. And that freaks them out. No, no, everything must be ordered, everything must be clear, we've got, we can't have this. Well, it, you may not can't have it, but it is. So I seclude myself into a realm of craftsmen in, into little narrow spaces. And I don't open myself. I, I, I live in my little relativity world. I live in my little craftsman world and I don't open myself to greater realities that may mess with my area because I want everything controlled and I want I want everything to work out just right. Let me try to finish this. I'm real close here. <clears throat> Sound that does not work toward keeping everything in tune is seen as not practical, ethereal, and purposeless. And let me tell you, until you get down on a quantum level with God and see the principles, it's going to seem ethereal. It's going to seem like, well, what, what are we just talking in the air here? What is this work? Does this go anywhere? Yeah. It, it goes to the heart of everything that exists. Can I get amen on that? Quanta, the, the subatomic particles, everything's made out of it, so we're at least getting in the right direction. I'll explain that more as we go, too. But the strings of existence play the song of all life. Nothing, whether practical or not, exists without the tune, without strings, without string theory. And I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs and try to get through this. This is just a little introduction on string theory. We're not anywhere near this, but since we're talking about 
The very universe hums in time to God's rhythms, and yet the materials of which they form become the objects because strings make up the objects. So we call it a microphone, and we call it a book, and we call it, a, but it's all made out of the same substance. And that's, you know, these strings cannot be seen. The atom could not be seen, but man harnessed it as a weapon. You know, atom, 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 atom. When you crash them together, it brings destruction. Atoms, when you crash them together, brings destruction. Atom, the nature of atom, when you crash them together, it brings destruction. That's weird how this works. No, it's not. It's exactly what's true spiritually. It's just a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth. You don't have to know physics. You don't have to. Know. You have to know the Lord. Uh, let's see. All right, I'll just finish with this one right here. Men know how to calculate the orbit of distant comets, but they can't ca calculate how their wife will react to something. <laughs> Scott's laughing. I wonder why. I mean, it's just amazing that you could eventually figure out Halley's Comet, how often it'll come around every so many years, right on time, da da da, da. You can calculate that to a T, but you go home and you are totally shocked at your wife's reaction. What? I didn't know you were going there with this. <clears throat> the calculations are not enough. There has to be the all in the thing or You'll never calculate her reactions or the true reactions, reactions of particles. I'm just telling you, you never will. Many, many people are not good with personal relationships. They isolate and find their value in correct calculations. You know, I'll, I'll try to end with this. You know, the World Wide Web's a wonderful existence the the uh, the world wide web the what what was the word we were using before for it like the world universe the world anyway cyberspace thank you very much cyber it's a wonderful realm because so many people are not forced to actually make contact and flow with people you can actually carry on an existence and say, I'm flowing with people. They don't know you. They think you look like that picture that you put up. You know? I've got this picture. If I ever do anything on the web like that, I want to put this picture of me up. It's everybody go, that's the guy that's talking in that thing. <clears throat> Many are not good with personal relationships. They isolate and find their value in correct calculations. Folks, the guys at NASA that put men on the moon were guys just like that. They, they, they didn't have much of a home life. They didn't have much of a relationship with their kids. And they're not the only ones. I mean, those, that's an example. People isolate and, they, and they're not good with relationships, but they can figure out the calculations. So we can calculate Halley's Comet, but we can't calculate our wife or our kids because your calculations are tied up to Jesus because you're one with him. And you'll never figure out the calculations in a true form till you get off of you and you get into him. And that's really what this is all about. And I want to show it over and over on all sorts of levels so that we can see by finding the Lord, we truly have found ourselves. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that the Holy Spirit do what no man can do. I certainly can't do. To communicate you on an all level. To bring us into a reality that transforms us, not that makes us complacent in our calculations.
Father, help us. We don't want to become physicists. We want to be sons of God in the image of Christ. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.